only, if you want to go to Rutherford.org, I wrote a commentary that went out today called 10 Reasons Why America Does Not Need to Go to War with Syria. Uh, it's got quite a bit of comment. Uh, and I want to read you the opening paragraph of that and then give you some uh, off the cuff remarks. For once, I'd love to hear a government official reject a call to war because it is immoral. Because we have greater needs here at home that require our attention and our funds. Because we're already, already $1 trillion poor due to these endless, mindless wars. Because America should not be policing the world. Because we refuse to enrich the military industrial complex while impoverishing our nation. Because endless wars will never result in peace. Because we have needle metal enough in foreign policy in the Middle East and cannot risk any further blowback. Because we're sick and tired of fomenting civil wars in far-flung places. Because we're not going to assist rebel fighters in overthrowing a foreign regime only to later unseat those same forces when they can't be controlled. Because using the overused fear tactic about weapons of mass destruction doesn't carry much weight anymore. Because the only compelling national security interest right now is taking back control of our runaway government. Because, in the words of John Paul Sartre, when the rich wage war, it's the poor who die. Because, while there may be causes worth dying for, there are none worth killing for. Because Gandhi was right when he asked, what difference does it make to the dead, the orphans and the homeless, whether the mad destruction is wrought under the name of totalitarianism or in the holy name of liberty or democracy? Because all war is a crime, and because there are never any winners in war, only losers. I served uh, during the Vietnam War. I was a military officer. I was an infantry officer who trained troops. Uh, that was my first inclination. It was, I served in the military from 1969 to 1971. Uh, my platoon was a filter back platoon for men who had served in Vietnam. What convinced me to take an anti-war stance was sitting and talking to those people coming back, those soldiers. People standing in front of me crying because of who they had killed. Helicopter pilots flying back, psychologically damaged because they were told to empty their weapons, their bullets, before they came back and didn't use them. One man actually told me he went over a village. He tried to stop the, the pilot with the gunners and they decimated the village. He said he saw women and children falling down and down. They were like ants on the ground. Uh, those things changed my life. And uh, so I have served in the military. I saw how the military operates. There are good people in the military, don't take me wrong. But my personal experiences in life taught me that we need to really consider what we're doing in some of these places. Far from places like Vietnam, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. Uh, before, I'm a lawyer, a constitutional lawyer, before we drop bombs on anybody or invade someone's country, and it's the same as invading a country when you drop a bomb on them, it's an act of war. We need full, open debate. We don't need some council making a decision. We don't need the president making a decision. We need to get a televised debate where Americans can participate. We need to know what's going on. Is there a national security interest? What is it? I have people that work in the Secret Service who tell me that the so-called national security interest, there may be more damaging leaks on NSA snooping and otherwise are coming out. So this war may be an awful distraction. Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize, but he overrides the biggest military empire in history. And when you drop a missile anywhere, again, I served in war, I know. I was an infantry officer. Women and children die. We're playing in the hands of Al-Qaeda. They know it. We look like monsters to people in the Middle East. For two summers in a row at the Rutherford Institute, I taught Afghani judges. They were all women. And they talked to me about their country. They said, it's devastating. There are people roving through the desert. Their homes have been wiped out. Not by Al-Qaeda but by America's missiles, drones, and bombs they were seeing. America is the biggest supplier of military weapons and weapons in general across the world. I've talked to soldiers and pilots, by the way, from Afghanistan who have studied with me in the summer. And some I've defended, by the way. I defend vets who are basically anti-government. They don't like the way, the things they saw over there in the war totally freaked them out. Uh, one actually told me 
He was an Air Force pilot, top of his class at the Air Force Academy. He sat in front of me and says, I really don't think we should be over. I said, why? He said, what blew my mind, he says, driving by opium fields with American troops guarding the opium. Whether that's true or not, I believe it is true. The other thing, I, if I demonstrate my new book, A Government of Wolves, is that the things we're doing over there are being brought home. 2015 drones are going to be flying in the United States. 30,000 by 2020, I think there will be more. It's a $30 billion a year industry, they're estimating, in the aerospace industry. These things are going to be equipped. They've been tested over in uh, foreign countries. They're coming home. They're going to be used against free speech protesters. They're going to have scanning devices. They're going to be looking at our homes. They're miniaturized now. They're mosquito drones, uh, hummingbird drones. The privacy is going to be eradicated. Uh, tasers, all the things we're seeing in this country are all tested first overseas. So all this stuff does have a blowback effect. Uh, my hero is Martin Luther King. Uh, he warned against this. In fact, he was actually shot exactly a year on April 4th, 1968, after he came out against the Vietnam War. He said, very clearly, that America had become a thing-oriented society. We no longer cared about people. Not only people overseas, but here. And unless we change our attitude about how we look at people, treat people, reaching out to people in love as if they are human beings. I'm not talking about just people here, but all over the world. I thought, as David said, we stand for democracy and freedom. Dropping missiles on people, killing people, expanding the, the empire worldwide. All the things we're seeing happening in our government, the NSA snooping on us, all the unconstitutional actions this government's taking, we have to be alarmed. Right after Martin Luther King was shot, an article appeared that he had written in which he said, the government no longer listens to us. Then he went on to say, the solution is this, we need First Amendment activity. I like, I like what David's saying about what's happening uh, during these debates. He said we need uh, militant, nonviolent resistance, that's the actual phrase. In other words, we have to get tough on these issues. Uh, debating is fine, but we're going to have to take action. And I think going to, to uh, our representative here at Hertz office and mass is a very good idea. If they don't listen to us, the First Amendment guarantees us the right to assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. But they don't want that, ladies and gentlemen. They want to move quickly here. They don't, they don't want us to know what's going on. Uh, give us a hint is all I would ask. If I was sitting in front of Congress, I want to know. Give me one clue what's going on here. We don't really know. They're just going ahead and bomb people. And uh, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I go to bed tonight. I'm going to be praying for those women and children on there and innocent people if you get wiped out by a missile. Okay, thank you.